Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. All right, today we are into, we're still in part three, Procedure of Pure Phenomenology and Respective Methods and Problems, but we're in chapter four, Theory of the Noetic, Noematic Structures, Elaboration of the Problems. These, these chapter titles and, and section headings are so long in SLA. Okay, anyway, so this is going to be the first part of um, three videos which will um, which we'll need to get through chapter four. And we'll start with the first section, which is the noetic and hyletic as real and no the noema as irreal. So we talked a little bit about the real, this notion of real, R-E-E-L-E, -E -E, in the last, the beginning of the last video. I kind of glossed over it because... Um, wasn't a hundred percent sure exactly um, what Husserl was getting at, but he he explains it all in this in this chapter. So we'll go through this in a bit more detail than I did last in the last video. So once we enact the phenomenological reduction, what uh, Husserl asks then: What are the real R E E L E? Every time I say real in this video, I think, is going to be that spelling. If it isn't that kind of real, I'll indicate, I think. Otherwise, take it as R-E-E-L-E, -E -E, that, that notion. So what are the real integral parts of the pure experience, Husserl asks here. And so the real is, and I did mention this in the last video, real is the way um, we treat the experience itself as an object. So we're no longer directed towards the noema of the experience, the noema as noema, as an object. Now we are directed towards the experience itself, including the noema and the noesis. <clears throat> so the experience itself becomes the object. And when we look at the experience in this way, when we make the experience the object, um, what we discern in that are the component parts that Husserl calls real. <clears throat> so it's distinct from the noema as the object of the experience, because now we're looking at the experience as a whole. And that's why, um, and what makes the experience the experience that it is, is the noesis, not the noema. The noema is within the experience. So, um, and that's why the real components, Husserl talks about here, are the noetic components. The, the, it's the noesis. And also the hyletic, or the material, that those raw sensations. Those are also part of what make the experience the experience, as opposed to the noematic, which is um, the object of the experience, that, that's um, known from within the experience, if you like. And so that is non-real, although I don't think Husserl ever uses that, that expression, but just for the sake of clarity, it's non-real. And the other word that he does use Sometimes, um, I don't think he uses it that much in this chapter, strangely enough. Um, but we used it way back, I think, in the first chapter, maybe the introduction. Irreal is the other word here. <clears throat> so anyway, that's what, that's basically the idea. Um, the material and the noetic components are the real components. They are what make the experience an experience. Whereas the noematic... Um, is irreal, and that's the object of the experience. So an example of this that Husserl uses is the color of a tree trunk. Now, this color, as bracketed, belongs to the noema, but it does not belong to the perceptual experience as a real, integral part of it, although we also find in the experience a color like something, namely the sensory color, the hyletic phase of the concrete experience in which the noematic or object of color manifests itself in varying perspectives. 
So here uh, we look, when we perceive a tree, <clears throat> we don't perceive the specific parts that make up the tree. We don't break it down into these specific components. For example, color here. Rather, we perceive at the tree as a whole. We see the tree as the tree, which is itself colored for sure. Then that's the this color that Husserl refers to in that quote. But we don't, we don't see the tree as being made up of a number of different features, like the color of the tree, the leaves, the branches. We don't see all of these pieces coming together to make a whole. We just grasp the whole at once. Um, and a good example of this is to think about lighting changes. If the light changes, so the color appears different, right? The, the color actually changes as well. Maybe the green of the leaves changes to a slightly darker color, a darker green, or the, the, the brown of the, the bark changes to a different color under different lighting. That's the actual color change. That's the hyletic change. But does the color of the tree change? Do we perceive the tree as being a different color? No. It's always that color that we, it's always the color that we, that we know the tree is. We know it's brown, even when we see it in dim lighting. We, we, the color may not actually be brown, but it's perceived as brown in dim light, not perceived as almost black, right? So the tree, um, is grasped as a whole with all of the features that come with it. They're all bound together in such a way that we, we don't see these individual components. We don't see the tree made up of these individual components. Um, <clears throat> the tree, the color of the tree is not the specific sensory color that is referred to in that quote. Um, it's not real, in other words. It's not a component part of the experience. It is a part of the noema, not the, the makeup of the experience itself. <clears throat> um, and so really the, the basic idea here is that when we perceive something, we perceive the whole, not the component parts, and which, which are the real parts, which are the real in the experience. The real are, of course, contained in there as real phases, but they're not perceived therein. Um, they're not objectively apprehended. And another way that Husserl talks about this is uh, to use the, the contrast between unity and, um, what is it, unity and, and variety. So if the perception as a whole is the unity, the non-real, the irreal, the noema, then the hyletic phases are the constituting various factors. That's the real. All considered, it is also quite beyond doubt that unity and variety here belong to totally different dimensions. And so indeed that every, every hyletic element has its place as a real integral part in the concrete experience, whereas that which exhibits itself in its variety and varies perspectively has its place in the noema. So basically, unity and variety there map onto the irreal and the real, or the noema and the hyletic components. And we've only talked about the, the hyletic, the, the actual sensory, the raw sensory data, the materials that go into the experience. We've only talked about those at the moment so far, but uh, Husserl notes that since the hyletic elements themselves are animated by noetic phases, these, the, the noesis is what shapes that hyletic material into the experience, into the meaning. It gives the meaning through the, the, the hyletic data. Um, 
Husserl also calls those noetic phases formal shapings or gifts of meaning. So all giving us different kind of um, different ways to approach the, well, what the uh, noesis does. Um, since the hyletic elements are animated by noetic phases, these and the hy hyletic elements both belong to the real constitution of the experience. I mentioned that at the start, but but in the in the um, in the example, we just focused on the hyletic data, the color of the tree. <clears throat> the real, um, in order to grasp the real, to apprehend the real, we have to approach the experience from a reflective viewpoint. So in reflection, when we turn our uh, attention away from the noema, from the object of the experience, to the experience itself, that's when we can grasp these real integral components. Um, and as Hussel always mentions regarding this, it, it belongs to the essence of every experience that it be open to this kind of reflective analysis. Every experience is susceptible, if you like, to being reflectively analyzed like this or reflexively analyzed like this. Another thing he mentions here, and this was quite interesting, was the, he talks about the Berkeleyan phrase, esse est per kippi. And uh, so this is interesting. To be is to be perceived. Husserl agrees with this, but he says not in the, the sense in which Berkeley means it. So a thing's essence or being, its essay, consists entirely in its being perceived, the per percipi, the noema. The souls are on board with that. Essay est percipi, nice. But where he differs from Berkeley is in, in that the percipi doesn't contain the essay as a real constituent. So the... The thing we perceive doesn't contain the being or the essence as these real components. Because, as um, we discussed already, when we the thing that we perceive is grasped as a whole, not as a collection of pieces, not as a collection of, of particularly hyletic data not as a collection of real elements. The real is not is literally not in the perception when we perceive it. It's only when we step back, reflexively analyze the experience, take the experience itself as an object, that the real components appear in the experience. But, but they're not there in the noema. Um, so to be is to be perceived, but to be perceived is not to be, where be is understood as constituted by real elements. So that's kind of cool. It's a nice, it's a nice way of thinking about this and putting putting some of these pieces together. I think. Uh, and the long and the short of this this beginning, this first section for us is that the noesis and the noema are completely different. He, although Husserl says there is a parallelism between concrete noesis and noemata. Um, so they're completely different. They're, they ha they're fundamentally different. Um, um, realms of being, do we want to say that? They're, they're completely different different structures of experience. Um, but there is this, this parallel between them, between them in their concrete sense, because in that sense, one always refers to the other. You never have a, a noesis without a corresponding noema, <clears throat> and vice versa. But considered as pure phases, um, they belong to completely different orders. So Husserl talks about a pure doctrine of noematic forms 
in a pure doctrine of noetic forms, which would include the hyletic and the noetic components. All right, so that's the first section done. The second section today is, is um, modes of givenness. So the modes of givenness are the noetic phases of an experience. So that's how the noema is constituted. For example, it could be constituted through perception, through memory, through fancy, let's say imagination, and so on. Um, and it, through all of these mode, different modes of givenness, the noematic nucleus remains the same. Uh, remains the same. Uh, and I've got a quote for this one. We are made aware of this identical element at one time in a primordial way, at another through memory, then again imaginatively, and so forth. But what are thereby indicated are characters in the appearing tree as such, discoverable when the glance is directed to the noematic correlate and not to the experience and its real states of being. It is not ways of being conscious in the sense of noetic phases that are rendered through these expressions, but ways in which that of which we are aware itself and as such presents itself. So in that quote, the uh, the tree came up that um, was the example, re reference to the example that Husserl was using. But the basic idea here is that these modes, the main thing actually, uh, is that these modes of givenness are expressed through the noema, not the noesis. And that's where they're discoverable. They're discoverable in the noema, not in the noesis. So, for example, in memory, the thing remembered appears for us as having been present already. That, that is built into the noema itself. It's not a part of the noetic um, constitution of the experience, the noetic component. <clears throat> that, it, it, the noetic, the noesis is memory, but this, um, it's expressed through the noema. And the same would hold for something like imagination, where the thing imagined appears in the form of an image. So again, the, 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 um, the mark of the mode of givenness is in the noema, not in the, in the actual mode of givenness itself, not in the noetic, not in the noetic phase. And this really reminds me of uh, Sartre's notion of consciousness as nothingness. Right? Consciousness is, it, it, it brings nothing of itself to any act, to any experience. It's, and this is how um, Sartre understood intentionality. Consciousness just is whatever it intends. There's nothing else there. There's nothing of consciousness itself in the act or in the intention. Whatever is intended, that is what consciousness is. It's this completely um, transparent um, lens, if you like, through which something can be intended, through which intentionality works. It, it, it itself has nothing, it, it contributes nothing, nothing tangible, nothing visible in the experience or in the act. Um, and and that, that's basically what Husserl is saying here. The, the noesis itself is not visible. It doesn't leave behind any trace of its passing or of what it is, what kind of mode of givenness it was. The only, the hint is in the noema itself, which appears with a certain um, flavor, if you like, a certain, if that, um, you know, and that might be something like it appears as having been present already, having already been present, which means that it's a memory, or it appears as, as an image with no 
um, relation to any any real thing, which means it's it's an act of pure imagination. Um, so that, that's kind of the important point from from that quote, anyway. But but a really interesting one um, regarding these modes of givenness, the way they appear through the noema, not not in the noesis there's there's nothing there to to grasp it's not in the real components it appears in the noema um and Hassel also notes that these modes of givenness these different modes of givenness each belong to different a different series because they proceed through different modifications so memory for example modifies its the primordial um, element in a way different from that of imagination, which modifies the primordial element in a different way. So you, you can have these chains of um, modifications in each mode of givenness, um, and that's that's they they belong then to different series because each mode alters or modifies the original the primordial element in a different way and and this connects with the discussion that it goes into next on levels so modifications can take place on on new levels in the overall presentation of a phenomenon so that they as well says dovetail into one another so even though they're, they're completely separate series as we, we understand them in that way because of because the modifications are different they can dovetail into each other through these different what Husserl calls levels in the presentation and there are two ways that this happens simple forms of present of representation for example having a memory and then um, within that memory there being another memory so a memory in a memory like an inception style dream within a dream. And uh, the other way is, is mixtures. So within one phenomenon, one experience, we might find the production of memories, expectations, fancies, and so forth. Um, and uh, so that's pretty, that's pretty straightforward, I think. And there are just a couple of extra things to note regarding this. Since the modes of givenness manifest in the noamata, each noamatic level has a level characteristic which stamps content on this level as belonging to it. And basically the idea there is just that the same, same thing as we mentioned before about um, the modes of givenness appearing through the noema, not through the noesis. Um, each level is that the mode of givenness in that level it appears in the noema. There's nothing in the noesis which tells us what it is. There's nothing in the in the um, the real components of the experience. That is to say, in the in the noesis or the hyletic components, which tell us what mode of givenness this is. That appears only in the noema. And if we're at if if there are multiple levels in the experience, each level um, or each each the noema at each level, the noemata at each level is stamped with a, a level characteristic, as well calls it, which just indicates the level and and obviously at the same time the mode of givenness. And the second thing that I wanted to, to note is this. Further, every noematic level is a presentation of the data of the levels that follow. But presentation does not here mean presentational experience, and the word of does not express the relation of consciousness to its object. And that might seem a little bit obscure, that quote, but it, there's, a, there's a, a, an important point behind it. So similar to the way, if you can remember, superficially similar, but if you can just remember the way that those real components were loosely contained in the noema, in the experience, but they're not perceived in the noema. So they're there, but 
not grasped, but literally not grasped in the noema itself. They, they're kind of in the experience, but not in the noema, if that makes sense. Um, they're there, but, but kind of not perceived. If you can just keep that in mind, the same kind of thing occurs here. All the, um, the data of the levels to follow is in the current level, even though it's not experienced. It's all of the data of, you know, so if we, if we have a memory and within that memory there is an expectation, the expectation is contained in the memory, even though it's not, um, where Husserl talks about it, actually Husserl says it's, um, there's a presentation of the expectation in that memory. But the presentation there doesn't mean presentational experience. So it doesn't mean, so we don't actually experience it, but it's there. It must be because the expectation arises from that memory. So it's there, but it's not experienced. And as he says, the of doesn't express the relation of consciousness to its object. So this is not the intentional of this is it's more a metaphorical kind of way of, of thinking about it. Um, and Husserl calls this, even though, so I just said it's not intentional, he calls this, if, you can, if, if we can let this, the use of the word slide, if we can be a little bit flexible here, he calls it a noematic intentionality. So not a genuine intentionality in the sense of consciousness um, intending an object, but it, it has that same kind of feel to it. This notion that the idea that the noematic content at one level contains the, um, or is, uh, <clears throat> is a presentation of the data that follows in subsequent levels. The of there is not, doesn't, it's not the intentional of that we that we've already discussed with regards to consciousness, but it's it, it has that same kind of um, feel. Oh, I've already said that, eh? <laughs> it has that same kind of flavor to it. That there there is this sense of something being um, foreshadowed, if you like, or, or um, dire a directedness. In the in that the level towards levels that come afterwards, the example that he he uses here is Dresden Gallery, which is the primordial perception. So visiting the gallery, you have the the actual perception, and then the first level we go back to the the gallery in our in recollection. So we're remembering the gallery and then we get immersed in a particular picture in a particular painting and and let our imagination carry us away and into this this world the picture of the world the picture of the painting into the world that the the painting creates for us and we, we get immersed into that that's the second level and each level here Husserl says was contained in the one that preceded it although not experienced and not explicitly there and not even literally there right it's not it's not as if you know we could take a magnifying glass to the to the memory and see the um the imaginative um experience that was going to come or you know there's nothing even in the memory that could tell us that could that could indicate what kind of imaginative experience is, is going to take place. Maybe no imaginative experience happens. Maybe you know, there are any number of imaginative experiences that could take place as a result of that. But in the sense of the chain that is being created here, the chain of, of these um, modifications and the levels within the, the, the experience, um, then we can talk about this kind of intentionality here this this idea of of subsequent levels being contained within the levels prior
And then he, he goes on to say, reflection then turns upon the noesis themselves. And so we now shift to the, the real phases, noting the levels explicitly. So noting the levels themselves, not just the, the noema that, that make up those levels and so on and so forth. So there's kind of a um, just a, an illustration, if you like, of, of phenomenology at work there, which is quite nice. Okay, so that's levels, and that is modes of givenness. The next section is being. So by being, the word being, Husserl means the sense of reality, he calls it, that we attribute to a thing. Or doxa, he uses that word, belief. And this is, this is on the noetic side, and it's on the noematic side, the things appearing real. So that's all he means by being. Our belief that something exists, that something is, or that from the noetic standpoint, from the noematic side, the thing itself appearing as real. So really different from Heidegger. If, you, if you're coming to Husserl with some kind of background in, in Heidegger, this is totally different from that. And he calls, he also calls the noematic correlate of this sense of reality, this being, he calls it ontic. And basically ontic just means modality of being on the noematic side. So again, and, and even more so, this is totally different from Heidegger, how Heidegger uses the word ontic. So these two words, um, especially ontic, um, be beware, be careful of this one that you don't attribute anything from Heidegger. You don't import anything from Heidegger into this into this word here. I mean, it doesn't play a massive role in Husserl like it does in, in Heidegger, but still um, something to be aware of anyway. So ontic, when I use the word and when Husserl uses the word, it just means modality of being on the um, side of the noema. And that and modality of being just means um, in relation to whether a thing is, appears as real or maybe um, probable or possible. And we'll look at all of those different but those are different um, modalities of being in just a moment. Uh, the other thing before we get into that is Husserl calls these thetic acts. He calls them thetic acts, which means that they posit being. So when we take being as our object, when we, when we focus on um, the being of a noema, for instance, then that is a thetic act for Husserl. And the idea, and what it, all it means, like I said, that it, it posits being. It, it takes be, the being itself of these objects as, or of the noema, as its uh, main, as its, as its concern. It deals with, with the being of, of an object. And this, Thetic act is totally different from the way that Sartre uses the word. Thetic is, is a big deal in Sartre, um, but it has a completely different meaning from the way that Husserl uses it here. So also, there's, there are lots of references to, to the, the post-Husserl uh, post phenomenologists here. Uh, and they're all different. They all take on these words and, and use them in different ways. So the modes of being that we've been talking about, on the noetic side, we start with the certain. Um, yeah, we start with the certain. And then we can we modify this, moving down a chain, to suggestion, presumption, question, and doubt. Those are the four modifications that Husserl identifies here the ontic modalities of being, so the those pertaining to the noema, and these relate back to um, the noetic modes. 
we start with the real in relation to the, the certain from the noetic side, and then moving down the possible, the probable, the questionable, and the doubtful. So that, like I said, those match the noetic and the noema. So we, where we have the noesis is um, suggestion, then the, no, the noema is possible. Presumption is the probable, and then question and doubt, they are the questionable and the doubtful. And just another terminological note, he also calls the noetic um, ontic modality plus consciousness. That's kind of the breakdown. So, for example, um, if we're talking about possibility, um, the possible is a is a no, is a noematic ontic modality. So, is a is an ontic modality of being. The noetic corresponding noetic modality would be suggestion, but sometimes Husserl refers to it as possible consciousness. Um, so just a terminological note, if you're reading through ideas as well, um, that that's something to, to be on the lookout for. And um, so talking about these, this, these chains of, of being, of mo modes of being, they comprise another series similar to the one that we saw concerning the modes of givenness. So we have a primordial form, a primordial element, and that which is then modified. And uh, the short quote for this, the certainty of belief clearly plays the part of the unmodified, or as we should say here, the unmodalized root form of the way of belief. Corresponding to this as its correlative, the ontical character pure and simple, the noematic being certain or real, functions as the root form of all modalities of being. Um, so what's what's important actually in that, we have that, the idea of, of this chain of, of uh, modifications or modalizations, starting from the root form and then... Um, modifying that in, in one of those four ways that we talked about. Uh, but what's what's really important about that quote is the way that it undermines skepticism. Uh, although Husserl doesn't mention that in this section, I think we have talked about this a while ago, but it's it's nice to see this come up here as well. So belief in its plain and simple, its unmodified or unmodalized root form is certain. That's, that's the important point. So this unique original position then is not on the same level as these other modes of belief. Why? Because it always appears as certain. It, 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 it's, a, it, it, it's the original root form from which all of the other modifications um, occur and to which all of them <clears throat> or in light of which all other modifications receive their meaning so it, it has a um, privileged place if you like in in this chain it's not just another mode of being like any other mode of being it's the original certain mode which which grounds everything, which grounds all modifications of being. Even if we end up with with doubt and you know um, we're questioning, we're we're doubting, still there is this reference back to a fundamental um, certain unmodified um, belief. And so Husserl suggests the term primary belief or protodoxa as this certain back reference, he calls it, back reference for all modalities of belief. And this is um, connects us with Merleau-Ponty, who in The Visible and the Invisible talks about the perceptual faith of the world. The world is, it's something which we, we cannot 
reasonably doubt. We cannot actually be skeptical about everything because where we're, our starting point for the skepticism is it goes back down this chain and ends in this protodoxa, this certain, or this belief which always appears as certain. You, you can't possibly doubt everything. It's, it's just incoherent to do that. And that manifests, or the reason why, the reason that is the case manifests quite nicely here with this, um, with the soul's discussion of being and the primary belief. And what's interesting, another interesting thing, there are many interesting things in this video. Interestingly, the same thing holds for the noetic. So when we are talking about probability consciousness, so the noetic side, when we're living within a probability consciousness, we're directed towards the object as probable. Okay, but we can step back then from that through reflection, through an act of reflection, and explicitly grasp the state of being probable as a constitutive character of the object meant. So we can step back from the experience, see the experience as an experience, not as not not um, directed towards the object of the experience, the noema. We can step back, see the experience as an experience, and this lets us see the noetic components, the noetic and the hyletic components, the real components of the experience. And what we see then is that this probability consciousness is given as being in the unmodified sense of the term. So this, the probability, probability consciousness, the noetic phase, is also a form of protodoxa. It under, there is a, a root form on the noetic side as well, beyond which we can't doubt, or which we can't doubt. Um, so there's a protodoxa for belief consciousness as well, uh, and, it, and it serves the same kind of role that we saw the protodoxa did for the, noemet, the noematic side, the noematic phases. So that's kind of cool. And that brings us to the last section of the video, which is affirmation and negation. So here we are just coming up to more modifications that lead back to a protodoxa. And really what, what all of these are, um, from the modes of givenness, the being, the affirmation and negation, these are all characters of um, the noesis and the noema. Uh, they're, all, they're all ways of, of describing or, or understanding these two structures of experience. And I mean, that's, that's the, obviously the, the, the title of the, the chapter. But um, yeah, that's what we're doing here. So affirmation and negation are another set of modifications that, that terminate in a protodoxa. We start with negation. Every negation is a negation of something, and this something points us back to this or that modality of belief. Thus, noetically, negation is the modification of some position, the latter term signifying not an affirmation, but a setting down in the extended sense of some form of belief modality. Its new noematic form of service is the cancelling of the corresponding positing character. Its specific correlate is the cancellation character we designate as not. The cancelling mark of negation strikes out something posited, or to speak more concretely, a posited meaning. So there we have uh, the noetic side. Noetically, negation leads us back to a protodoxic mode of being, which is not affirmation, but it's um, a kind of neutral setting down. It's, it's prior to affirmation and negation. It's what makes those um, modifications possible. 
So again, something that can't be doubted, something that, that, that can't be affirmed or negated. It's prior to those. It's that that's why it it, it, um, it works as protodoxa. And noematically, uh, negation is the cancelling of any positing character of being. So represented with a not, and this is just the modification of being into not being, negating something. Um, it's also this also refers back to the same protodoxa that we talked about with the noetic um, but the important thing that I wanted to mention here modification of being into not being this is not metaphysical right so don't we want to avoid starting to think of of non-being as as equal to being or non-being as having some kind of real existence in the same way that being does that, that's really that's it's reifying both of those terms in a way that Husserl doesn't do because it's phenomenology we're not talking about metaphysical realities uh, some kind of capital B being and you know as opposed to some kind of capital N, non-being. These are metaphysical postulates, nothing to do with phenomenology. Um, so, yeah, just, just, just wanted to throw that in there because any time we start talking about being and non-being, th there's always the tendency to start thinking in terms of metaphysics again, metaphysical realities, and then the situation just deteriorates exponentially from there and before you know it you're believing in some kind of buddhist um, nothingness as the source of everything or something so we're not going to go down that path this is pure phenomenology um, but one last thing about that quote everything we said in there applies equally to other modes of being to the possible to the probable, to the questionable, which can all be modified with negation to impossible, improbable, and unquestionable. And when, when that happens, these modify the whole noema. The whole posited meaning gets um, inflected, if you like, with this, this character of negation. And the same thing, exactly the same thing holds for affirmation. It's the same as negation, but instead of a cancelling, it's an underline. It's an underlining. It confirms a position by accepting it, instead of removing it as negation does. And also, this results in a series of noematic modifications in exactly the same way that we looked at above. Um, looked at above if you're reading as I am, or looked at before if you're watching the actual video. And uh, it also talks about reiterated modifications here. So this is just a short quote, so I won't throw it up for you, but I'll just read it. Since what is negated and affirmed is always an object that is, it can, like everything we are conscious of as a mode of being, be affirmed or denied. So basically the idea there is that... Um, uh, the denial of something, uh, sorry, the negation of something or the affirmation of something is itself an object for us. That, or it can be seen. It can, uh, we can turn it into an object for us, for ourselves. And when we do that, through an act of reflection, when we do that, that negation or affirmation itself can then be negated or affirmed. So we can adopt... Um, the character of negation or affirmation towards this affirmation or negation, which is an object for us. And obviously we can make an infinite chain of these um, modifications, and that's what Husserl calls reiterated modifications. And we're almost finished actually, but there's one last thing I wanted to note regarding noetic, noematic character, sorry, noematic character and reflection. Um, Husserl says we must not think noematic characters are determined through reflection. So when we don't, through an act of reflection, 
determine the noemetic character. We grasp what concerns the correlate as such through the glance being turned directly on the correlate itself. We grasp the negated, the affirmed, the possible, the questionable, and so forth as directly qualifying the appearing object as such. In no wise do we here glance back upon the act. So reflection, the act of reflection is completely different from the experience itself, from the experienced phenomena. So we have to be careful that we don't mix those up. Reflection is a completely different act from, of, from experience. And reflection tells us about the act itself. It gives us those noetic components. The so calls them also noetic predicates. But it doesn't tell us about the appearing object as such, the, no, the noema or the noematic predicates. And so when we... Um, when we grasp the object as through one of the, these characters, through one of these modifications we've talked about as negated, affirmed, possible, questionable, etc., um, we're not we're not we're not performing an act of reflection on the noema here. The noema appears as negated, or it appears as affirmed, or as questionable, or as probable. There is no, um, this, and this is just, again, the distinction between the noema and the noetic. The, um, the noema itself appears as, with the character of these modifications. It's not something external that we are imposing on something um, different from, from the character. The, the, the negation goes, if you like, it goes right to the core of the noema. And so that the noema appears as negated. It doesn't appear and then have this negation kind of tacked onto it as this, or super added. I like that word, actually. It doesn't have the, the negation super added on, on top of it. The, the thing appears as negated. So just keep that distinction in mind. The, the act of reflection, something different from the character of the noema. Um, reflection doesn't determine noematic character. Noematic character is in the noema itself. And that's pretty much all I wanted to say about that. So it must be time for a summary. The first thing we looked at was the noetic and the hyletic as real and the noema as irreal. So the noetic and the hyletic, this is the experience as an experience. So we're stepping back from the object of the experience and making our, our object the experience itself. And this, we could think of this in terms of variety. So... Um, the, the parts, the various parts that go into, or the various component parts that go into the experience, that's what we're getting access to here. That's what uh, gives the, the experience meaning. And these appear to an act of reflection. And then we've got the noema, which is experience as the object intended in the experience. And we can think of this in terms of unity. Um, the noema is grasped as a whole, not as a, um, a collection of discrete component parts. The constituting real components are not apprehended in the noema. And we had that little um, Berkeleyan phrase in there as well. Essay est per kippi, but per kippi est non essay. I'll leave it at that. Then we looked at the modes of givenness. So we had the noetic phases, um, or these are noetic phases, 
for example, perception, memory, those kinds of things. But what was important here was that these were expressed not in the noetic itself. They're, they're known or grasped not in the noetic itself, but through the noema. And the we also looked at the way that phenomena are divided into levels according to the modifications of these modes of givenness. Uh, and these terminate in a primordial element. So we have the primordial ele element which gets modified and there can be a chain of modifications going on here. Um, but they, they terminate in a primordial form. And we also looked at what Husserl called a noematic intentionality, which was this idea that every noematic level contains the data of levels to come, but obviously not in the same way that consciousness itself is intentional. Uh, but that, that was um, a nice way to think about that and, and just a nice way to understand how um, these levels are structured, these levels of, of experience kind of structured. Then we looked at being, and essentially this is doxa, belief, on the noetic side, and the thing appearing as real on the noematic side. It's basically the sense of reality we attribute to a thing. And um, there were no noetic modes of being, which were correlated with ontic modalities of being. So we had the possible, probable, questionable, doubtful, and their um, noetic counterparts. Um, and the other thing of note here was the protodoxa, the idea of the protodoxa, which is this primary belief at the base of a chain of modifications. And what was special about this was that it was always certain. It was an unmodalized, certain root form, which grounded all of the other modifications. And this protodoxa exists for both ontic and noetic, or belief consciousness, phases. Finally, we looked at affirmation and negation. And these were other modifications which also led back to a protodoxa. A protodoxa which was not affirmation, but was a kind of neutral setting down. Um, in the same way that we saw with the protodoxa in relation to being, the protodoxa here, it's not affirming because it is prior to, it grounds all future affirmation and negation. And we also looked at reiterated modifications, which is basically just an infinite chain of negations and affirmations. Affirmations and negations negating or affirming other affirmations or negations. And that is where I'm going to stop today. So that's the first of, I think, what will be three videos for this chapter. But I hope you, uh, I hope that helped. A little bit for you if you if you're working through the book thanks as always for listening and i'll catch you in the next video